Okay, good afternoon and welcome to Keeping Your Balance with Dr. Michael Fernandez and Dr. Aaron Helm. Um, my name is Erica Narducci. I'm the program director here at Cancer Support Community Delaware. Um, and we are live streaming the program. So hello to anyone who might be on Facebook or watching this um, recorded session after we've held it live. Um, I do encourage you to ask questions during the presentation. You can unmute and ask, or you can put it in the chat and I will interrupt the presenters and ask the question. We'll also have time for um, questions at the end. If you're on Facebook, you can put it in the chat and um, I will do my best to monitor that and make sure we ask the question as well. So um, Erin has worked in um, oncology physical therapy for a number of years. She even worked at specialty rehab in the Helen Graham Center. Uh, and Michael has worked um, just the, these past five years, mostly with senior population and with balance and has recently gotten a certification with oncology rehabilitation. Um, and both of them are doctors of physical therapy. So we welcome you, Michael and Aaron, and I turn it over to you. Thank you so much. So today we're going to be talking about keeping your balance. And we'll see if I can get this to go. Next one, there we go. So the objectives today, so why we'd love to have you all chime in is to really talk about the association between falls risks and cancer. So why do you feel unsteady when you're going through treatment? Why do you feel unsteady after a diagnosis? And then talk about the risks and how you can spot those risks in yourself and your loved ones, in your environment and minimize the risk of falls and improve your balance. And then what you can do. So what can you do before treatment, during treatment, and after treatment to really help to improve balance? So we'll talk about all those things as we go through. And like Erica said, please stop me. If you have any questions or something isn't clear or you want more information, please let me know. So we'll go into a little bit of the background. So why do you feel unsteady? So the CDC says that one in four Americans age 65 plus falls each year, and only 50% actually report that fall. So, you know, the, oh, it wasn't really a fall. I just hit the ground with my bottom, right? Like, or I just caught the side of the counter as I misstepped. Like those things actually count as falls, um, but not everyone actually says that they fall it. And one in five of those falls results in a serious injury. And that's for someone that does not have a cancer diagnosis. Having a cancer diagnosis in and of itself amplifies that risk of falling. And the prevalence ranges from 33 to 50% or greater. So if you have fallen as you're going through treatment, you're not alone by any means. The important part here is one in 20 of those falls can result in an interruption or cessation of treatment. So if you're feeling off balance and you fall, there's a risk that the severity of that fall could be greater and it can stop you from going through your treatment. So we really want to intervene early so that we can help you to get everything you need as you go through your cancer journey. So when they talk about risk factors for falling, there's a whole gamut of things that in the research they show can, can increase risk. So patient risk factors, so your intrinsic risk factors about you would be history of falling. So if you fall once, there's a double the risk of falling again. Balance deficits, obviously. So if someone is off balance, you're more at risk of falling. Medications we'll talk about. So four or more medications, um, having difficulties with walking, having muscle weakness, pain, orthostatic hypotension, so that when you get up and you feel off balance, you feel lightheaded, where your blood pressure doesn't want to just quickly respond, that can increase the risk of falling. They talk about impaired ADL, and what ADL means is activities of daily living. So you're having difficulty getting dressed, you feel off balance with that. You're having difficulty doing things in the house, prepping your food, things like that. That shows that there might be more risk of falling. And then obviously females, we always get the brunt of everything, right? <laughs> so, so if you're female, you have a higher risk of falling um, greater than 80 years old, arthritis, difficulties with memory, with um, recall, doing multiple tasks at once can indicate a higher risk, visual impairments, obviously. And then incontinence, one thing we don't necessarily think about but with incontinence, if you're rushing to get to the bathroom and you're getting up in the middle of the night to get there, you might be more risk of falling. 
environmental risk factors would include things that we can't control but might be going on in our environment. So when you think of like the Helen Graham Cancer Center, we used to talk to everyone at that center about how can we decrease risk of falls for people coming in the door. So wet floors was a big one. So did they have umbrella bags for someone? So, so looking around at your environment to make sure you're not gonna slip and fall. If you're getting wheeled to an appointment and you're sitting in a wheelchair, so sometimes they'll do that for radiation because they're worried about people getting up and falling. But if your wheelchair is unlocked, so if someone wheels you to an appointment or you wheel a, um, a patient to an appointment, you wanna put those locks on because if you are sitting there and you're having a conversation and you go to get up to go talk with your physician, if those wheels are locked, it's gonna roll out from behind you. Same thing for foot rests. If the foot rests are out, when you go to sit, when you're sitting and then you go to get up and you trip over those foot rests, same thing. Rugs. So physical therapists always cringe at throw rugs because <laughs> if you aren't lifting your feet up or if you're using a walker and you're pushing it to, and you're relying on it heavily, it's going to catch on that rug. So that's one rushing when you're walking and then caregiver hand placement. So we all know that love the one that wants to grab onto your arm to keep you safe and steady. You need to tell them that sometimes that's not always the most helpful because you don't have your arms to swing to keep your balance. So it throws off your momentum and it throws off your ability to kind of put your hands out and keep your balance yourself. So if you need a little extra support and they want to be helpful, hold on to them. Don't have them hold on to you. And that can be more helpful. So that's just for some an individual that doesn't have a cancer diagnosis. But then when you look at having a cancer diagnosis on top of the general risk factors, all of these risk factors, so balance, medications, our ability for walking, strength, this takes a while. <laughs> Orthostatic hypotension, cognitive impairments, visual impairments, and incontinence, all of those are amplified when you go through treatment. So thinking about balance, if you're on chemotherapy, we'll talk about that. Medications. So who's not on multiple medications when they're going through treatment? You know, just the chemotherapy and the steroid alone, there's two. Muscle weakness from sitting, muscle weakness from the steroid you're on. All of those tie in together and they can amplify that risk of feeling off balance or unsteady. So we're gonna talk about some of the specific risk factors and then what we can do and how we can spot those risk factors in ourselves and then what we can do about it. So chemotherapy is a big one. So falls are two to three times more common in an individual receiving chemotherapy. And that's increased with your cumulative dose. So you're talking about those cycles of chemotherapy. So it might not happen the second cycle, it might not happen the third cycle, but you get to your 12th cycle of chemotherapy and you might be like, wow, I really feel unsteady. I didn't feel this the first couple of cycles, what happened? And then more than one neurotoxic drug in your chemo cocktail. So you know how you might have ACT. So adriamycin, cytoxin, and taxol is a common one. Some of those drugs are more neurotoxic or more damaging to nerves than others. And that's when we get into talking about chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. So that numbness and tingling that you can have. The impact of that can extend up to five years and past five years post-treatment. So it's not something that's just going to go away quickly. So when you're finished your, your therapy or your treatments and you still feel off balance or you still have numbness and tingling, that's not abnormal. So just know that it's not abnormal, but there also are things we can do about it to help improve it. So when we talk about CIPN or that chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, there's multiple facets to it. So there's a sensory component. So that meaning where your sensation feels off. So it might feel completely numb. It might feel achy or it might feel pins and needles or it might feel like electric shocks when you pull your blankets up over your feet at night. And it's typically, they call it stocking and glove distribution, meaning it starts in your fingertips, it starts in your toes and it spreads up the hand like a glove or it spreads up the foot like a sock. That can also happen with the motor component to it. So meaning the muscles. So they're gonna be impacted most at your fingers, at your toes, at your hand and your ankles. So if you're thinking about holding an assistive device, holding a cane, something like that, 
one, it might be uncomfortable because of the sensory piece of that, the sensation, but it also, you might not have that grip strength. So you might find jars, opening jars might be difficult. Grabbing on and pulling yourself up on a handrail might be difficult because of that. But the other piece of that is when you're walking, you might not be able to lift and clear your feet as well because those muscles in your feet and across your ankles aren't going to be kicking in quite as well if you do have this neuropathy. So people might say that they're okay when they first get up in the morning and they're walking, but by the end of the day, they feel like they're dragging their feet or they go out on a walk and they're on an unsteady surface like on grass or on gravel and they tire out really quickly and their feet ache. That's part of that motor component because the muscles can't stabilize you as well. There can be an autonomic component to CIPN, so meaning how your blood pressure and your vital signs respond to activity. So that orthostatic hypotension. So thinking about someone that might be on a, a vinca alkaloid, so a vincristine is known to cause constipation, but it also causes blood pressure drops sometimes. So you go to stand up and your blood pressure doesn't kick in right away to pump that blood back up and you start to feel dizzy or lightheaded. So with that, you really want to take your time, pump your ankles before you stand up, stand up, don't step away from your chair and make sure you stay in that position before you then go for your walk because your blood pressure just needs a little bit of extra time. And then there's a vestibular component. So thinking about your inner ear and how it maintains your balance or your equilibrium, that can often be off with CIPN. So there's lots of facets and lots of components to CIPN that can really play a part in impacting your balance. And I took this from the CDC's website, but this is just a list of different medications. And now when you're going through treatment, you don't always get to say, hey, these are the treatments I've, medications I wanna be on and these I don't wanna be on because they cause sedation or they cause dizziness. But when you're done treatment, it's really important to talk to your navigator about the medications you're on. And if you're having side effects during treatment, don't be afraid to speak up and say, hey, I'm taking this or I'm taking this and I really feel off balance or I really feel dizzy or confused because that can lead to falls. And again, like I said, if you fall, you're more likely not to be able to complete the treatment. So you really wanna have open conversations with your physicians about that. Muscle weakness, I mentioned a little bit about that before the motor component of CIPN, but muscle weakness can come on even at the presentation at your diagnosis. You could already be starting to feel weak and not know why, because the cancer cells can have an impact on your muscle strength. So. There's that component. And then there's also when you get chemotherapy and you have steroids paired with that, or you go into radiation and you have steroids with that, those steroids preferentially impact your proximal muscles, meaning the muscles that would be at your t-shirt and shorts. So like if you were wearing shorts, it'd be right around your bottom, right around your hips. If you were wearing a t-shirt, it'd be right at your shoulders and your core, your muscles in your abdomen. All of those muscles can get weaker more quickly than other muscles in your body. So thinking about getting up and down from a low chair, going up and down the stairs, if you're feeling more weak with that, that can increase your risk of feeling unsteady because now you don't have that balance when you start to get up. So you really have to heave yourself out of a chair or you really have to pull yourself up and down the stairs. Cancer-related fatigue. So you guys probably all know that term by now if, you've, uh, if you're in the middle of treatment where it really describes that overwhelming exhaustion you feel as you go through treatment. And it's not related necessary to how much activity you've done. That fatigue can play a role in your balance because when you're fatigued, you're not going to be doing as much. You might take shortcuts to doing the activity or you might be less efficient with doing your walking or your movements around the house. And that can make you weak and it can also make you more at risk of falling. Same thing goes for immobilization. So if you're not able to get up, so let's say you just had breast surgery and you, you can't move. So you had a, a deep flap where they do a cross section at your abdomen and they have a surgical cut there. You're not moving very quickly after that. Your muscles can get weak and you can feel off and your blood pressure can be off. Same thing with disuse. So you don't feel like getting up because you've just been through the, the range of chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, that can also impact those muscles. 
we talked about CIP and that distal weakness. So the muscles across your ankle and your, and, and your foot, those muscles, if they're not working properly, they're not going to be able to help you to step quickly. They're not going to be able to help you to clear things or walk on uneven surfaces very well. That all ties in to how we walk. So our gait. So they've shown in research that individuals that have gone through treatment, specifically that have CIPN, that report these symptoms of numbness and tingling, have increased postural sway. And what that means is when you're standing still, if you close your eyes, how much do you sway? How much are you able to maintain your balance? And individuals with neuropathy sway more because your ankles and the, and the joints are not giving the same feedback to your brain or not giving it as quickly to get you to kick in those muscles to stabilize yourself. You also can have reduced reactions. So you get bumped in the grocery store, your muscles, those proximal muscles at your bottom, at your hips, your core, they're the ones that get you to, to quick correct and stand up or quick take a step they're not going to be as quick when you're on steroids and you have that proximal weakness. Altered sensation, obviously, if, if your sensation is off in your feet, you're going to have more difficulty, but you also may have decreased foot or leg clearance because of weakness and then reduced endurance because of the treatments as well. Cognition isn't something that is always talked about when we think about physical therapy, we talk about movement and strength and, and balance, but 75% of individuals going through treatment experience limitations. And it might not be, I can't remember anything, but it might be, I used to be able to go to work and do 50 things at once and be able to juggle, or I used to be able to handle the kids and be making dinner. And now I can't do all of those things at once. So that higher level processing or multitasking might be decreased. And that's not always picked up on a pen and paper questionnaire that's in, that's in a physician's office, but it's now shown that a lot of people experience this and there's a relationship there between your balance and your, your ability to multitask or have short-term memory issues, things like that, and fall risk. Specifically dual tasking, they've shown that if you're walking across a, like a 10 meter walkway, and someone asks you to have a conversation with them, your speed at which you walk is going to significantly slow down if you're going through chemotherapy because of this issue, because of the cognition. So this slide here, I mean, you're, you're all living it, you've all gone through it, but just basically provides a table of, here's the different impairments that you can have as you go through treatment. And it's not just one, right? So you might just be starting out in surgery and then going to chemotherapy, or you might have radiation and, and chemotherapy at the same time. And you might feel okay at first. And then all of a sudden it's like a brick wall hits you and you're like, what happened? Or it might be sneaking up on you incrementally. So this is just here to have an awareness of there's multiple layers that can contribute to your balance and can contribute to your well being as you go through treatment. So, we need to be able to kind of hone in on the aspects that might be impacting your ability to kind of progress and maintain your quality of life. Which brings me to I'm not that bad, am I? So, often I'll get patients that are like, I'm not that bad. I don't need a cane. I don't need to have physical therapy. So, we're going to talk about some of the signs of having an increased fall risk. So if you're a furniture walker, so if I see you come into my clinic and I see you putting your fingers on the wall, I'm going to start saying, do you think maybe you need an assistive device? And then you're going to get mad at me and maybe not come back. <laughs> but, but, but the whole idea with that is if you're finding yourself walking through your home or you're finding yourself out in the community and you're always kind of just touching down, like you just need that extra little touch. What you're doing is you're teaching your brain that every time you feel slightly unsteady, you need to reach for something. You need to touch something outside of yourself. You're not stepping, you're not balancing yourself. You need something extrinsic. So then when you're in the grocery store and someone bumps into you because they're on their cell phone and you reach for the can of beans to hold you up and it doesn't, then you end up falling because you didn't take a step 
because your brain wasn't, that wasn't its first response was to take a step or to catch yourself. It was to grab the beans and the beans did not, did not do the trick. So, so if you find yourself furniture walking, that's when to say, okay, maybe I need to get a little extra assistance here. And then you can talk to a professional about like, what kind of assistance might I need? It might be like two or three sessions in PT or just having a conversation about what exercises could I do at home to better my balance. Scuffing feet or drop foot. So someone tells you they can hear you coming. So you're slapping your feet when you're walking or you feel like you really have to lift up your feet as you're walking, even if it's at just at the end of the day. That might mean that you need a little bit of extra assistance. If you find that you're always staring down. So a lot of individuals that have CIPN and they have sensation issues, you can't rely on your feet to tell you where you're at. So you rely on your vision and you're looking down. So if you or a loved one is staring down at their feet while they're walking, we need to do something about that. We need to intervene because you can't walk around with staring down at your feet all the time. You can try, but it may not work out. Postural changes. So talking specifically about individuals that have abdominal surgery, you don't stand upright right away after surgery. And oftentimes they give you restrictions as to how early you can stand upright. But then you're stuck in a chair, you're stuck in the recliner, and then you're kind of in that bent over position and the muscles in your abdomen get weak. When you're coming forward, your base of support or your weight is shifted forward. So you're more likely to tip forward than if you trip. Decreased gait speed is something we talk about in PT because when you're walking slower because you're more fatigued or you're in pain or you're on a medication that makes you drowsy, you're less efficient with your movement and then you're more likely to, to fall. So if you're finding like, I just can't catch up, I just can't, well, like I used to, to walk circles around my wife or circles around my husband and now I can't do that. That's something that we can tease out and we can talk about how can we improve your endurance? How can we make you more efficient? What muscles are weak that's contributing to that? And then multiple attempts to stand from a chair. So if you feel like, like you have to like heave yourself up and it takes you a couple tries out of that low couch, then that's something that we can work on because we're thinking about that steroid impacting your proximal muscles like your bottom, they can't necessarily get you as strong as you need to be to get out of the chair. And then obviously that history of falling and dizzy upon standing we talked about. So there's a, a, sip, a simple and quick fall risk screening that they often will give at physician's offices. It's, have you fallen in the past year? Do you feel unsteady when you're walking or standing? Or do you worry about falling? If you're reading this and you say yes to any of these, then it's worth having a conversation about what can you do to help um, to improve your risk of falling so that you have better balance, so that you feel more stable. The other questionnaire, which I like, is a fall risk self-report questionnaire. If you type in stay independent CDC in Google, it'll pop up for you. Or if you have a loved one that you kind of want to run it through, they have a, gr a lot of great resources on the CDC website. They even have like a checklist for safety for your home. Um, but if you have four points or more on this, that shows that you have an increased risk of falling. So it just goes through and it provides a rationale for why it matters, because not everyone believes me when I say <laughs> when I say you need an assistive device. So if you have lost some feeling in your feet and it says numbness in your feet can cause stumbles and lead to falls, or I often rush to the toilet, rushing to the bathroom, especially at night, increases your chance of falling. So it's worth going through and seeing are there multiple factors that could impact my balance? Some things we'll do in therapy would be a five times sit to stand, meaning we'd have someone cross their arms and go from sitting in a chair to standing up five times in a row. And if they can do it in less than 12 seconds, we're like, great, your muscles are strong. You're not showing any difficulty with that. If you're doing it in more than 12 seconds and you can test it at home, um, then we need to talk about what can we do to strengthen? What can we do to help you improve that? And what factors in your treatment journey are impacting your ability to stand up quickly? Single leg stance, so standing on one leg. So if you did that at the counter, could you do that for 20 seconds? 
seconds. Could you do that for 30 seconds? And the reason why that matters is if you don't have stability in one leg, when you have to step over something, whether it's a curb or it's a dog at home or it's clutter, whatever it may be, you might not have the stability for that. The other one is called a Romberg. So that's this one here where your feet are together. So you stand with your feet together and you try to maintain your balance. How do you do with that? Can you do it with your eyes open? Great. Now what happens when you close your eyes and you take that vision out? So now you're relying on that sensory piece and the inner ear to maintain your balance. So if you start to really sway a lot or you feel like you have to catch yourself, then that's something that we could be working on. And the same thing goes, they call it a sharpened Romberg, but legs one leg in front of the other. So that just makes it harder. So if you wanna test it out after dinner, <laughs> Environmental factors. So what can you do? Throw rugs and lighting, bathroom setup, stairways. There's well-meaning friends that wanna hold your arm back while you're trying to walk and knock you off balance. All of those pieces. So they have a check for safety on the CDC website, but really think about, even if you're just starting through treatment, what can you do to ease your treatment journey? Is there a lot of clutter? Are there cords in the way? Can you tie them up and get them out of the way? Can you get the throw rugs out of the way for the time being so that you don't have that risk? Can you put lights, night lights along the walls at night so that if you have to get up and go to the bathroom, you're able to do so? Can you put a lamp next to your bed that you can turn on as you go to the bathroom? Can you put something at the top of the stairs that has light? So it shines a little bit more light and there's a little more contrast on the stairs because sometimes having higher contrast can help with vision because vision changes can occur as you go through chemotherapy as well. So we talk about having a non-slip surface in the bathroom. So that's always helpful, especially in the tub. Having something like a bench, like this top right-hand corner here, you can see that there's a bench there. So even if you have a step over tub, you can sit down on the bench and bring your feet over and slide in. Or if you have orthostasis where you feel lightheaded, sometimes being in that hot shower can really impact that and make you feel lightheaded or dizzy. Having a, the ability to sit down while you're in the shower, you might not use it all the time, but having it there might be helpful. Grab bars is also helpful. And then thinking about having grabber tools. So like things that are, are low that you need to reach or something that might be in a corner that you might not be able to get to. You could use a grabber. I'm not affiliated with Amazon, by the way. <laughs> or thinking about your shoelaces. So when you have CIPN and your fingers are numb or they're painful, tying your shoes is not always easy and it can be difficult or it can be irritating. Having something like these curly no-tie shoelaces is something I often will tell patients about because you can just pull them and let them go and it will tighten and you don't have to worry about tying them. So they, you don't have to worry then about the shoelaces coming off. So what can you do? So those intrinsic factors. So we talked about the environmental, the grab bars, things like that. If you're fern walking, we want to talk to you and we want to see what you need to get you more steady. So that might mean a physical therapy evaluation. That might mean talking to your physician about getting an assisted device or just doing a community program where, where you can be in yoga or you can be in a balance class. Um, if you are having significant pain, that often will alter how you're moving. So you want to advocate for yourself through treatment. Even if you're completed treatment and you're having pain, it can alter how you move as well and increase your risk of falling. Orthostasis, again, that's something to talk to the nurse navigator about. If you're feeling lightheaded when you get up, it can be because you're dehydrated. It can be because of the chemotherapy treatment you've received. There could be multitudes of different factors that go into that. So you want to have that addressed as well. And then vision. So oftentimes vision will change as you go through treatment. So having a conversation with the physician, because they'll oftentimes tell you, we'll wait six months, wait a year until you're out of treatment before you go back to your eye doctor, because your vision is going to continually change as you finish out treatment. And so there might be things that you can do, like adding 
something along the stairs that adds a high contrast or different lighting in the home until then to help you. So specific to what we can do in therapy, what exercise can do, I showed you that slide before of all the different impairments that come up, all the different issues that come up with surgery and chemotherapy and radiation. Here's a list of the side effects that can come with treatment, but then all the different types of activity that can improve those side effects. So I've mentioned a bunch of side effects that feed into your balance, but it's important to know that there's different things you can do for each of those side effects. So getting moving and getting in a program whether it's through physical therapy or whether it's through cancer support community, can really be beneficial to really help to improve your balance. So there's evidence that physical activity and falls prevention in 65 plus without a diagnosis of cancer can be beneficial. So they show that just doing balance exercises and functional exercise can reduce that fall risk by roughly 25%. When you add resistance exercise into that, it goes up to 28%. And just with Tai Chi, there can be a reduction of 23%. 42% reduction is seen if you do three plus hours of functional and balanced exercises. So meaning you could do three one hour sessions a week or you could break it out into smaller components. There's not specific guidelines in the oncology population for what exact exercises are the most beneficial. But what they do, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network put out guidance saying they want individuals that have a cancer diagnosis seeing someone to get early and preventative education on use of durable medical equipment. So like something in the bathroom, the grab bars, things like that that can help, assistive devices, and then get a home safety evaluation. So an occupational therapist is a great one for that, where they can really tease apart what is in your home that might be a risk of falling and what you can do to reduce that risk. What modifications can you make? And then the American Society of Clinical Oncology said that anyone that's having deficits in those ADLs, so that is activities of daily living, or they're having falls, they should see a PT or OT to prescribe strength exercises, balance training, have an evaluation of what kind of device you might need, and then a home exercise program. Sorry about that and then talk about fall prevention and home safety again. So if you do go into a physical therapy program, so you're like, I really have a lot of these things that we're talking about today, I wanna to talk to a physical therapist. If you're looking for someone specific to oncology, there's questions you want, you kind of want to vet your physical therapist no matter where you go. So you wanna find out, are they familiar with the past, current and upcoming treatments you're having? So are they familiar with the chemotherapies you're on and what the side effects are? Are they familiar with the radiation and what that impact may be on your balance and your treatment journey? And then how do they incorporate your treatments into your plan of care? So you might just be starting out and just had surgery and you feel weak, but you know you have chemotherapy coming up. So what's their plan for that? How are they going to modify your activities as you go through treatment? They should give you a home program. So what activities you can do at home and then they should be able to recommend to you community programs to participate in following therapy, or maybe even after they do an initial evaluation, they can say, hey, I think you're actually doing really well. I just want you to try these activities out in your community. So there's a Live Strong program at the YMCA. Um, there's different exercise programs you can participate in, all of those things they should know about. And I'd probably belabored these points, but. Just having a diagnosis of cancer can increase your risk of falling. So you wanna make sure you're advocating for yourself. Your treatments can amplify that fall risk. And really you need a comprehensive assessment by someone to, to identify and fully address those aspects that can contribute to your fall. So it's not just one piece. You're, you, you're a puzzle when you, when you come in and you've had radiation and you've had surgery and you've had chemotherapy. And we need to look at all of those side effects to treat all of you. It's not just one piece that we're treating and that we need to really individualize that. So do you guys have any questions? I can stop share.
and feel free to put it in the chat. Oh, go ahead. 